All right, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and whoever you are may be listening to us on this particular platform right here. I have and I am surrounded by a bunch of sisters. We have diversity here. We have diversity of culture. We have diversity of age. We have diversities of status here in this particular video what we're going to speak about. And I'm not making this a rebut or something like that. I'm just going to speak simply so that people can comprehend and understand the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew faith. What is it really truly to be an Israelite? Because when we're speaking on the subject of women in head coverings, women in shorts, women in dress, and what was the other part? That's it. We're speaking on that. We, I realize, and, and, and they all realize, that me and you come with different diversities of opinions. And the reason why you come with those different diversities of opinions is because you've only been influenced by one culture in your life, period, point blank, all of your life. And so that is the mindset that you end up coming from. And that's the only perspective that you can speak from. So when you approach the scriptures, when you approach the Bible, you look at the Bible through the lenses of your cultural rearing, rather than actually trying to step outside of the influence of the culture that you have been uh, tainted by, and I'm going to say those words tainted, and really truly divorcing yourself from that culture to see what the scriptures have to say, many of your questions are laced with doubt, which the book says foolish and unlearned questions we should avoid because they do gender strife. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going <laughs> to use all the diversity uh, that, that we have all had influence on, and we're going to answer these questions for you, and the reason why I have these sisters in the video right here is because you get to hear their perspective coming from their own mouth and coming from their um, influences, convictions, and challenges. And again, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me real close. I am an Israelite, a true Israelite. All right? Uh, on my birth certificate, it says in. That means Negro. That means aboriginal. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to go off and try to diverse in culture right here or diverse in subject, but I'm going to leave it at that for right now. You can figure that out later. All right? When I came into the faith while I was in the military, I was a staff sergeant in the service. Uh, as soon as I came to the understanding about the Shabbat, my attitude is totally different than a lot of your attitude out there. Today, I still, even to this day, I just got one this morning. People ask me, what should I do on the Sabbath? Now, we all know that the Bible says in Acts 5, 29, that we ought to obey Yah rather than man. Is that correct? Yes. I obeyed Yah. As soon as I found out exactly about the Sabbath, I had I was a staff sergeant at this particular time. I had eight years in. Um, in other words, I was on my way to a nice career to a retirement. But once I understood about that Sabbath, I actually went to the authorities there in the military and told them I won't be working another Sabbath day again. You know why? Because... Even though I've been displaced from my language, I've been displaced from my land, I've been displaced from my people, my culture, and, and my heritage. Once the conviction of Yah's word came into me, it wasn't a question for me whatsoever at all what to do. When I read that and I understood that it says you don't do any work on the Sabbath, that was enough for me. I didn't need anything other than that. And I was willing to to suffer the consequences. And that's what we're not willing to do here in America because we have so many diversities of opinions. There's so much compromise going on. It's like that when we're living in this world today, everybody wants to make deals rather than actually being obedient to what Yah says. Now, this is my wife, Sister Carol. I got married to her when she was 18. Is that correct? I'm 51 now, so do the math. That's 33 years. Um, we was actually together before and then, even in a patrol stage in the Hebrew culture, is considered marriage. So I could say we've been together 34, 35 years, but you wouldn't accept that because you have all of us that is old enough and has lived long enough in this land, we would generally say that you're not married unless you have a license that comes from your culture, what you've reared and learned here, and you've been reared and learned in this society. So many people that ask these questions usually come from a European background. They come from a Western mindset. And there's a difference between a Western mind and an Eastern mind. Even still today, when you look over in the East, what has been redefined as the Middle East uh, during the First and Second World Wars, uh, if you watch the way that the women carried themselves over there, it's totally different. 
than the uh, colonialization and the influences of the Europeans throughout the world. It's totally different. So with that said, we'll start with the head covering thing. It has been said that there is no law in Torah that tells you that a woman has to wear a head covering. Well, I beg to differ. And the reason why I beg to differ is because the Bibles that we have, or the books of the Bible that we have presented to us today has had pensmanship put to it. There are a lot of things that have been literally taken out of the book that should have been included in the book because of the diversity of this European culture and the influence on it. I'll give you an example. Have you not read about the book of Gad? Where is the book of Gad? Have you not read about the book of Enoch? Where is the book of Enoch? I mean, there are many books. What about the book of the Apocryphals? Where are they at? There's the Gospel of Thomas when we go to the Renewed Covenant. In other words, there are many, many books out there other than the canonized scriptures that has been given to us that speak to a whole lot more than what we're saying. Now, let me give an example about uh, the unspoken as well as the spoken word of Torah. This past Shabbat, I gave an example on, and I asked a question, can a woman divorce a husband? Now, in Hebrew culture, if you read the Torah, there's nowhere in the Torah. There's nowhere in the whole of Scripture that says that a woman can divorce a husband. Yet and still, there's a divorce provision in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. And what you have to do is be able to understand Hebrew culture, Hebrew language, Hebrew perspective, and you have to understand their lifestyle. In Hebrew culture, it works on abuse. It works on um, abandonment. It works on all different types of things. And the only way I can explain it is this. Is a wife or does a wife have a greater status than a servant? And of course, that's obvious. The obvious answer is yes. A wife has a greater status than a servant. Over in the Torah, it speaks and said that if a servant or a master smites out the servant's tooth, that the only deliverance for that servant is freedom. They're charged to go free. Now, that is a lower status. Now, let's go off into if a husband is abusing his wife. Is she supposed to stay in that abusive relationship? Or do we use the principles of the Torah in order to guide us? That's the reason why Paul said in Romans that I speak to them that know the law. Many of you don't know the law. And so we, now we're on the subject of head coverings. Again, a true Israelite, people that come to, that are in this, and they realize who they are, as well as those who convert, because many people, according to Esther 8, 17, of the land became Yehudim's. And so anybody, just like in Ruth, it says, your people will be my people, and your y'all will be my God. So there's no such thing as discrimination when someone wants to come in and embrace, I'm going to say it again, embrace the culture, the heritage, the people, the language, everything that is involved with us as a people. But the problem we have in here in America today is that people come from their European perspective or come from the um, Orient or their Orient perspective or come from different other cultural perspectives and they want to come over here and feel comfortable in what they want to do without an unregenerate, without a transformed mind, and without a mind being conformed to his image. We want to be able to stay the same way that we always have been and be comfortable with it, but we don't want to transform and we don't want to change to the image that y'all will be pleased with. That's what we're dealing with today. So we come up with these logical fallacies or these questions that, that would actually uh, seem to be to try to rock people back on their heels why we have to do this and why we have to do that. First of all, you don't have to do anything. Just the ministry in itself, a straight way, just the ministry itself, a straight way, the fruit bears witness of itself. Without even any word saying, the fruit of this ministry, starting with the men, as well as the women, the wives, and the daughters of Zion, it bears fruit of itself, of not only our obedience, but our commitment to the word of the Most High Yah. Now, when y'all daughter speak, you got to speak louder than you normally do uh, because, you know, Brother Brent's over there holding it, all right? So, Sister Carol, starting with you, all right? What do you believe is the issue or the dilemma or the reason why a lot of people have a, a bunch of, uh, or have a bunch of tr a trouble issues with the head coverage from a woman's perspective? Well, in this society, you see 
so much is placed on vanity and the outward adorning that it's hard for a lot of women to cover their beauty or cover what they have or for as far as head coverings it's their hair um, but the scripture doesn't the word doesn't tell us that it's a hair covering it says it's a head covering and I know that a lot of um, other other cultures want to use um, the take with Isaac and Rebecca it says she veiled herself so she may have already even had something on and then completely covered herself because veil veiling is even different to me than just a head covering correct and if she didn't have a veil available then where did she get it from how did it you know you understand what I mean she had to, to have it literally on her in order if you follow me but go ahead um, and then even going into the the new covenant um, because a lot of people want to use Corinthians um, as their backing as to why they don't think they should. Well, your hair is given to you as a covering, but if that were the case, it also says that if a man has his head covered, he's dishonoring his head, which we know is Yah, Yeshua. But um, if that be the case, then every man would need to be bald. And I believe in the uh, scriptures, it talks about you know the shaving of the head and things like that. So it just doesn't match up with their line of thinking, but with the mindsets being so westernized and so geared towards vanity and things like that, I think that it's a strong pull for for people to actually do it. And I think a lot of times wives push their husbands into a certain mindset as to what they want to do. They don't want to do it, so it's pushed for, you know, to find something in the scripture or show something culturally that they think is not right. So. That's my take. On it. Okay, I have a question. Sister Ashley, you want to go ahead and speak to that perspective? Uh, being considered after this world society a Caucasian woman, uh, you want to go ahead and speak to the question I just got finished asking Sister Carol, then I have a question following up behind that. Okay, I believe she spoke very clearly and correct because it is the very common question that we receive, and it's always laced with the doubt that I have a will not to do it, whether mm -hmm. it's because I feel embarrassed or everyone's looking at me or because I'm looking for a scripture that says you should wear it and you should wear it all the time, they are going to try with their will to uh, to fight against and resist um, what actually Yah does with all of us. So just, just to add that, Pastor. Okay. Uh, again, you know, I made a statement earlier that the biggest fight, and I'm talking about in my 25 plus years of actually being in the ministry, um, without question, the majority of the kick that I get from this particular subject comes from Europeans. It comes from a Western mindset. We just had um, a sister here, her and her husband, spent four or five days with us. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. She's only been listening to us three weeks. And she came here and had her head covered on, changed her dress the whole night. And mind you, Many of us, we transform and change without even knowing what the scripture says because it's what the Ruach or the Holy Spirit was doing in our hearts. But it, it's the vanity that comes from the world that makes us as if we're losing something of us, which the Bible says you're no longer your own anyway. You're bought with a price. Uh, you're supposed to be conformed to his image. Nobody should be seeing you. And so I understand in, in this culture, Western, American, European philosophy is, is vanity is, is big. It's real big. But when you become an Israelite, or if you are an Israelite and you come to the understanding uh, of who you are, should we not mother bull up because of pleasing our husband, the father, be able to lay down all of this without question? Yes, sir. Um, Speak a little louder, mother. Yes, sir. I was just thinking about um, we should be hidden. And the head covering hides us. Our long skirts hide us. You should be hidden from the world. And um, mostly with women, they like to be seen. They've been taught to be seen. I show this and show that. Mm -hmm. and coming up as um, as an older woman, think about when I remember all the black women, they had long dresses on. Mm -hmm. You didn't see a woman in them pants. You didn't see that. And she always had a head covering on her head. I, and I was also thinking about my mother. The only time I saw my mother's hair at night when she was taking down, take her head covering off, 
and comb my hair. Mm -hmm. I didn't see my mother's hair during the day. She always had something on her hair. So we was raised up to be covered up. But then when we uh, started going to, when they integrated schools, that's when the whole thing started falling apart. We, we, we were, we saw the pants because in black schools, they didn't wear pants. Right. We was taught to cover up. If you come to school with a pair of pants on, you just fail. So we, we knew to cover up. We knew not to be, you know, flirty and we knew all this stuff. But because we was pushed, we had our own little cult, you know, um, ways of doing things ourselves. Mm -hmm. But then when we was pushed into the European, well, I mean, we were just pushed into the European way. So we started following them. And then from their own, we just been going downhill. So when we come this way, it should be something in you to say, I want to cover again. The spirit should convict you when you don't want to cover. So evidently you don't have the Holy Spirit if you don't want to be covered. Yes, ma'am. And and Mother Bullock, you are a widow. Yes, sir. Is that correct? All right. So just just by what we've done spoke already, we've already shown diversity. Sister Carol's been married to me for 33 years. Sister Ashley is a, a mother, married, European descent. Mother Bullock, married before, uh, now is a widow. Over in Numbers 5, when the woman was getting ready to be judged because her husband suspected her of adultery or some a spirit of jealousy came upon him. Mm -hmm. An example, watch this, without even words being spoken or said, for those of you who always want chapter and verse. Chapter and verse has never convicted anybody to want to change anyway. It's, it's a heart condition. The first thing they did was took the veil off this woman before she could even receive judgment. I mean, again, culture. Now, if anybody's going to be legalistic, that's legalistic in the reverse form by saying, show me chapter and show me verse. But what about if I'm showing you our culture? What about showing you our heritage? What, what about showing you the way that we've done things? Not only that, mm -hmm. I can go back even into the early, the early history of this country right here to where I can show you pictures where a woman never, ever wore shorts or a pair of pants. Mm -hmm. But before we digress on that, let's, let's, let's stay in here. Because behind me, I have two teenage daughters of Zion. How old are you, Tia? What's your name? Capricia. Capricia, how old are you? 18. 18 years old. And so what people would say, and these are two single daughters of Zion, they're 18 years old of marriageable age. And what they would say is, okay, um, it, it, it's a sign that, you know, when they don't have their head covering on, mm -hmm. um, that they are available. All right, I'm going to show you the difference in being a tribe as opposed to coming from the perspective of here in this world. As a tribe, are they not defined as the 12 tribes of Israel? Yes, and we always saw them together except when they were in rebellion. Is that correct? Yes, sir. In a tribal format, everybody already knows who's who. Mm -hmm. And if there was any question whatsoever at all, you know what, what the man would do if he was interested in a daughter of Zion? He would actually go to the father and inquire of the father. He just wouldn't go directly to the woman, unlike this European society, mm -hmm. unlike the culture of this Christian society right here. That was an order, a respectful order to everything. So whether you believe that she had a veil on or not, that's it's almost like exegesis. Exegesis, reading more into the text and important more out of it, even though it's there. You could say I'm doing the same thing, but the bottom line, we're staying concrete with this. Because when people come here, it's amazing how all of, that the people already already know that these are single women. Do you know the reason why they know that they're single women? Because they don't hang around the married women unless they're in a work environment. They hang around with each other. They support each other. They actually they even work together with each other at times and stuff. But that's just a total difference because you don't see men sporting with them. Like you would see a husband sport with his wife. Am I making any sense? See, all this is concrete. It's never a question with us because we know who our people are and what they're doing. But if we come even from the spiritual perspective, or we should always be praying without ceasing. Does that mean every single time that you want to pray? And, and I hear straightway, and I'm going to say it again. Our culture, our lifestyle 
is not even in question of this world. It speaks for itself. You may hear a sister out here in the garden singing to y'all. You may hear them all of a sudden they, they, they're singing. The next thing you know, they're praying to y'all. So should they just take a veil out of their pocket or take it off the back of their head and keep praying, put it on top of their head when they could just already have it there? When you should be praying without ceasing anyway? These are just opinions that I'm putting forth to get you to think, to show you that those of us that are in this, we think totally different than those of you that are coming to this. Did you have a complete understanding of the head covering when you first came here? I had a very base level understanding that it was a distinguishing factor between me and other peoples, which if you go back even to the scriptures, you have Canaanites, Jebusites, you, you have all these nations, you, you read a lot about the men and them being men of war, but they had women, and those women were to look a certain way or be a certain way and, you know, uh, tribally be with their people. So if I want to put myself with Israel here at Straightway, I'm going to appear as them to show that my heart is for them and for the Father. So that was my very base level understanding coming in, that I wanted to have the relationship that these women had with the Father, and I was going to, uh, you know, put myself in uh, appearance. So you want to be just like these people, just, just like Ruth like, and them say. Yes, just like. Your God would be my God. <laughs> yes. And your people would be my people. Yes. And that's without you even understanding a bit about what the scripture it's says. It's true. From day All right, young daughters, I need y'all to speak up. We'll go with you first, Tia. So, Tia, you wear a head covering now. How does the head covering impact you as a young daughter of Zion? Uh, well, it's just like speak louder, Tia. Louder, Tia. Yes, sir. You, uh, it's just like you said. Um, you're supposed to be praying without ceasing. And it's easier for me when I want to pray. I don't have to go pull out a head covering just to pray and then take it off and keep on putting it on, taking it off, take put it on, take it off. It's easy to just wake up, have it on, pray, do what you gotta do. Later on if you gotta pray, you don't have to run to the house, put on the head covering. And um, it shows my submission to the father and to my dad actually. Very good, and I'm gonna say it again. I'm going to keep putting emphasis on this throughout this video right here. The fruit of straightway speaks for itself. Many of you out there have all these questions and all these doubts and all these diversities of opinion, but yet and still your lifestyle pales in comparison to these dedicated daughters of Zion up here who have actually really truly given their lives over to the Most High God and they're not holding anything back in reserve. See, there's a difference when you have an opinion where you feel like you're going to lose a little bit of you. Well, you should have been done lost a little bit of you. All of us should have. Does that make any sense? And, uh, of course, then the next question, people go, and I'm going to just divert from this for a second. They will say, well, why come the men ain't got to change? Who told you that, that men don't have to change? Here at Straightway, men, we don't wear shorts. We don't go around wearing shorts to our knees with, with tassels hanging off the sides. And the reason why we're doing that, again, everything in this world has to do with, with the appearance of how you're carrying yourself. Because the way that our sisters dress and the way our brothers dress, that nobody here is going to be lusting after each other. Now, if you have a spirit of lust on you, no head covering, no dress, and no birches is going to stop anybody from lusting, if you got it. You follow me? But out here, uh, how do you sisters feel as a whole? Do you feel like that you're on display? Or do you feel like at any given time that you're being exploited by men when you're out here or when you go outside of the land? We're actually more respected, <laughs> I think, because of the way we dress and the way that we carry ourselves. Because even, especially when we're here amongst our own people, there's just a, a sense of respect for the women. There's a, an honor, in, in a sense. And even when we go out, um, I'll have brothers, op no, not brothers, but men open the door for me or people I don't even know so and it's not anything that an a fleshly thing it's just a you see a, a real woman and it makes you want to be respectful and honor like the old way so it's it's here and when we're out most of us should be getting the same kind of respect I want to say this um, I should have said it from the beginning I'm going to say it now when I speak to y'all I'm coming from the perspective as a descendant of a bloodline Hebrew Israelite 
I realize that the Bible does not discriminate of other nations coming into this culture right here whatsoever at all. Because any man or any woman that fears y'all work of righteousness with him is accepted with him. Um, but I'm coming from not only a historical point of view, a biblical point of view, a scientific point of view, uh, a hieroglyphic point of view, an icon point of view, uh, that we are the original people. And I'm trying to show you a difference in attitude, even especially from those who actually see what we are as a people and choose to leave the vain world and to actually follow Yahweh Elohim with us and be accepted. All right, so Sister Caprice, let me see. You've been in the faith for a very short period of time. This is your second journey to straightway. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Speak louder, Caprice. Yes, sir. All right. How did you come to put on the head covering? Um, I was um, watching one of your videos, and you just, I mean, you explained why we should put on the head covering, and that's how I came to learn of it. And at first it was hard because I was still in high school. And the peer pressure was difficult. And it's, you start to think, you know, what people think about you, you know. And then it's the attention that you also get when you wear certain things, like my mother pull up the same that you get. And you're wondering where would that go? And at some point, you stop wanting to feel the condemnation. You start feeling the condemnation. And so you, you kind of put yourself aside and realize why you're doing this. And it's not about you anymore. And then why you want to do this. And then you put it on. Now, mind you, you didn't know what the Bible had to say about head covers, did you? No, sir. Faith come by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of Yah. And you can't hear without a preacher. My perspective and point of view is going to be a whole lot different than a lot of other pastors out there because not only do we preach it, but we live it together as a tribal community. We've been doing this for a long, long time. Now, I understand that they may have some merit to it, but I'll go back again. Why did Rachel turn around and, and put on her veil when she met her betrothal? And why did the judgment over there in Numbers 5, that this, the, the priest took the veil out of the woman? And Paul, who is a doctor of the law, who knew the law, spends 1 Corinthians 11 explaining patriarchy, explaining headship, explaining the whole balance and the order of Yah, which many of you resist today. A head cover is not going to make you more submissive. It's going to take a transformed mind, and the Ruach is going to have to be in there ministering to you and help you to do that. But again, if I read something in the book, and I can perceive something in the book, it's no question to me what to do or what not to do. When I told my wife, you're going to put a head covering on. Um, at first, she was like, what in the world? That was the Western part. But because of her love for me, she showed submission. And that is an outward sign of submission, that she is under authority. She puts it on. She didn't even quite understand. Most of you out there with all this fight and all this visceral attitude in you, even if things are proven to you, you still don't submit to it. So what is that? What is that then? Now, <clears throat> let's go to someone of what we would call, has been classified as a Hispanic background. All right? Sister Carolina, you tell us, Sister Carolina, how old are you? Uh, 35. And she's a, a married Israelite woman. What are some of the challenges? First of all, what is your perspective on what you understand about the head covering? And then what some of the challenges you realize that people want to face out there? Speak for you. Um, as far as the head wrap, all I did was read it. And it was just what it said. It was a simple, as you know, just learning your ABCs for me um, because my conviction was more like when Paul ran into the law of Yahweh and it told him that it, he was in sin against Elohim and that's how it was for me so a lot of times when I read stuff like that it was just an automatic time to change turn straight to Yah and go with that um, as far as what young ladies face out there like mother said it is a lot of vanity it's a lot of insecurities um, they think that they won't get the man that they have their eye on or that man will look at them, you know, and they end up missing out that our men don't look at that. Our men look at the more spiritual, the, the relationship you have with Elohim. They don't look at your flesh. They don't look at or wonder what your hair is like under your head wrap. They're looking at your relationship with Elohim. But the women out there that are coming into this that are new into the way, 
that is their mindset, their vanity, their the insecurities, the you know, just those kind of things that they uh, struggle with. That the enemy, of course, will be speaking to them to have them not see what Elohim is actually trying to get them to see and receive, and that is a righteous husband and a righteous husband receiving a righteous wife, whether it's eighteen and up. And so that's what. It, that's pretty good because you think about this. She just said something key. When people see our sisters, they judge them by the content of their character rather than the vanity of their looks and the shape. That's what they're drawn by more than anything. And and they're and you you've all experienced it, even including the people out here who have no conviction whatsoever at all. That they show more honor and respect for you than men do. The men do than than their own men do for them out there in the world. Because of the modesty that is involved. I'm, um, I'm watching uh, Sister Jordan walk this way with, with uh, little Nehemiah, your son, all right? So, and I started thinking, because you know, the next subject is um, shorts or pants, all right? Under no circumstances do our women out here wear pants. Now, many people want to know what they do in the winter, where they have leggings. They wear leggings, insulated leggings, but they still have a skirt on. Because, you know, out here, on our land, there's never a, a, a question of who we're looking at. If I have to look at you 100 yards away, we know exactly who, who what they are. It's a male or female. It's easy to distinguish. Are you following me? Um, but, you know, without going into a whole bunch of history, I'm just going to make this real simple, okay? All right? Over in the Torah, the word for well, what we commonly call pants is birches. Birches. All right? And there's a difference. Now, when you would look on a lot of hieroglyphics and stuff, you didn't see people, especially when they were in slavery. See, when a lot of people were in slavery, we were stripped. And so a lot of things that you see on those hieroglyphics is you're looking at a stripped people. As a matter of fact, the prophets speak to us how we will be naked and we will be bare and we will be stripped. And our lovers would despise us because of us rejecting him. So a lot of times you will see us without um, a, a shirt or you'll see us with just with um a midsection uh, kilt, kind of like a Scottish kilt on. But then there was a diversity there, too, because if the men needed to gird up their loins, they had a way that they could tie it up where they could be able to run, whereas the women didn't have that because they wasn't designated for war, unlike here in America. Now, you think about this for a second. Here I am, a man, and I got birches on, okay? All right? The whole purpose and reason for this particular dress is, is because, stand up, Ashley. All right? When I go to the bathroom, I unzip and I pull out and I go pee. When she goes to the bathroom, how does the woman go to the bathroom? Up or down. You hear that? She has to pull up and like that. You get it? That's just plain. Are you following me? Men stand, women squat. <laughs> I don't know. Nowadays they making urinals where men where women can stand up and pee. <laughs> I mean that's there's a whole bunch of stuff going on today. But is that making sense? Now, when we get to the point today, which I think we're heading there, where men are squatting and women are standing, we are finished as a society. Are you getting it? We're literally done for as a society. But that is the way that things are literally supposed to be. So uh, when it says that a, a woman ought not to wear that which pertaineth unto a man, whether we like it, comprehend it or not, when I'm wearing this, this is a man's dress. Because... Even in the culture of this Esquarian society, the Victorian age, they had women that they would wear these big old hoops in order to make sure that their shape was diverted. You remember them big old hoops and stuff like that? They would wear hoops to make sure that their shape was diverted. <clears throat> and today, because we are more wicked and more fallen in character and nature, rather than us going back and looking at history, hopefully not to repeat the same mistakes of it, we look to our own vain mind and we look at what we want to do and we try to force that Bible and everybody else who is contrary to it to be in the culture of their own mindset. That's the problem that we're running into today. And so rather than having a set apart people that are distinguished, rather than having a set apart people that are a lot different than the culture and the people around us, because the book did say we are different people. We've got people today that want to come over here and be Hebrews. They want to be Israelites, but they want to change our culture. 
They want to change our heritage. They want to change the way we do things. And again, I will say this again. Straightway is without question a beacon of light in this world. Our women are different in character, in dress, in attitude, in set-apartness. That means holy. Our men are different in responsibility, in making sure that they're covered, being the authority. This is a patriarchal rule, just like God is. So when Eve transgressed against Yah by disobeying Adam, she went against the rule of the order of the thing when it said, don't eat. That's why it says the woman being in transgression. When you go read Isaiah, the third and fourth chapter, it's going to talk about the condition of the women in the end days and end times. And this haughtiness that's going on in order to try to force the Israelites to change the way that they ought to be. See, we've been where you are. All our sisters have been where you are. They know what it means to allure a man after the lust of the flesh. They know what it means. You, you can't tell them anything about uh, vanity and about uh, even your questions. But they can tell you a lot because they live set apart and they do this. All right. Does anybody got anything else before we continue on? Anybody got something to add? Yes, Go ahead. Um, Sister Capricia said something, Pastor, about, you know, being out there and being a young girl in high school, that attention that all women desire. But once you start walking in the ways of Yah, you don't desire that same kind of attention. You right. desire attention from the Most High. You desire the respect and the honor, but you don't desire the unwanted cat calls or whatever they call them and things like that so it does it actually changes your heart and the intent so you dress so that you don't get those things because that's not where your heart is anymore you remember over in the book of Enoch most people don't read it because it's not canonized it's not in the original 16 11 King James Version of the Bible one of the things that caused these angels quote unquote uh, you can read also in Bereshit, the sixth chapter, mm -hmm. they gave issue was because of the way that these women wore their hair. Mm -hmm. And it drew these angels. Mm -hmm. And then it ended up being giants in the land. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that are really, truly there. It's just if you want to see it or not. Like I said, um, should a woman, if she's married, stay in an abusive relationship? Well, the Torah doesn't teach me that. It doesn't teach the, the priest that. It doesn't teach the elders that. But where are you going to find it that it says a woman cannot divorce a husband because it's not in there? Yet it is still in there. So I, I'm, afraid that, I'm afraid today that people look for wiggle room. Mm -hmm. they, they're looking for a great compromise. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To justify what they want to do as opposed to doing what Yah wants them to do. All right? Now, do y'all have any problems out here with men lusting after y'all? When people come here, they usually have a great honor and respect for y'all. Is that true? How do you feel? Let's go with you, Sister Ash. How do you feel as a woman for the first time in your life being respected without having to um, show your long, flowing hair, um, the size of your titties, and the shape of your ass? Uh, it's a beautiful process. As she said, it initially starts with... Uh, you know, the change and getting used to not having the cat calls and not having the attention for uh, vain reasons. Then you become very uh, established with what you're doing. So it's a process. And then after you're established and you mature in it, you begin to develop such personal convictions about your appearance that you don't want certain parts of your arms showing or certain parts of your, your legs. So you kind of revert back to even more and more and more holiness. So you can see the status of maybe a young daughter of Zion that wouldn't be as covered because she's just coming in. So I watched the same process for all of us and it creates, um, uh, you know, a man is able to see a woman's maturity through her conviction and through her uh, appearance because of that. So we could tell who is, um, if you want to use the term new, coming in and someone who they're looking at to attain to. But uh, to answer your question completely, I am very well respected uh, here, as well as all the, the women that I live around, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else because of what we receive from the, the men, the honor we receive. I'm actually going to hit this too because, okay, look, Sister Carolina back there, she is a, will be, in this world, be uh, a, considered a middle-aged woman, and all our daughters of Zion, every single one of them are beautiful. They all desire. So what do you mean by that? People will come here. And they will say, um, Pastor Dow, or they would ask one of the elders, 
you know, because the question is, if the only way that, okay, if you look in the Bible, if we go from the perspective that you can distinguish a married woman from an unmarried woman is based on if they have their head covered or not, they will say, well, how do y'all do it? Well, we do, it's simple. Again, how do you do it in the Torah? If you wanted to get married to a woman or betrothed, do you not have to go to the father? Okay, her father's passed on. All right, so what do you do then? Because, I mean, if a man comes here and he sees her, first of all, he's not going to be lusting after her because she doesn't leave anything to be desired. That, that There's no theater that he can actually play in his mind unless he's pervert. <laughs> you follow this here, pervert. So if he has desire towards her or he thinks he has desire towards her, as a righteous man, what he would do is he would actually go to either the pastors or the elders and ask of her status. Again, that's in perfect keeping of the Torah without things even being made to chance. See, because out there in the world, you look at a woman, all of them uncovered, married or not, and it doesn't stop the lust whatsoever at all. Makes no difference. Thereby, they are not only sinning, but they're causing you to sin. You're burning in your lust because there's no distinction whatsoever at all. So the same way that they had to go to the men or the fathers or the authority back then is the same way today. So when they come here and they realize that this sister is already married because either they inquired or they saw her sporting with her husband. Sporting means just seeing her walking alongside and her carrying on a conversation, if you understand what I mean. You can tell the difference. When people are married, that's just, they, they don't have to get out here and put it on display. Look, I'm married. That's just a total different way they carry themselves. You can tell our sisters are single because they don't go and sport around here with single brothers. They just don't do that. And that's why it's hard for many of you to come to this. It's hard for you to understand this because you don't live in a tribal environment. You don't live set apart. You don't live the way we do. And therefore it's difficult. So a lot of times you wrestle with a lot of things that we're saying. And what we're putting forth, because you don't comprehend, you don't understand. Jeremiah 3.15 says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I'm going to say it again. And the fruit of straightway speaks for itself. You got anything that you want to add, hon? What about you, mother? I think you said it all. You covered it very well. She did say right before the video, you can't leave Israel any wiggle room. Oh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> what does that mean, Mama? Come on, explain it to us, Mama. What does that mean? Um, with, with Israel, um, we're the type of people, if you give us an inch, we're going to take your whole mile. So with us, you have to say no pants, no shorts. Because you said, well, it might be just a, a, okay, we'll take it to another level. You can't give us any wiggle room. We'll use that little bitty oh, opening right there to, to go run with it and develop a whole new doctrine. Yes, sir. And Mother Bullock, how old are you? 63. Mother Bullock, 63 years old and a widow. They say, well, how does she get married? Again, the same way. If somebody's interested in her, the first thing she'll do is come to me. Wait a minute. She's 63 years old. She sure is. Mm -hmm. Because the majority of the men that come to me, she wants to know their character. She won't know what kind of men they are. And she knows that I know because our sisters just don't mm -hmm. sit around and date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you follow me? Because in, in, in our culture, once you say you are betrothed, that's just like being married. Mm -hmm. There ain't no going back. Mm -hmm. When that woman agrees, it's signed, it's sealed, it's delivered, it's said. The only thing that's left from there is the consummation. Out there, you can have a boyfriend one week, boyfriend next week, get rid of this one, get rid of that one, get rid of, thereby filling up what the Bible says, an evil and adulterous generation because of all this illicit, irresponsible sex that's going on. And then we wonder why we're giving over to fornication, both idolatry in the spirit as well as in the natural, giving over to idolatry. See, I, you know, we view ourselves as a people, we have not yet arrived. We still got a long way to go. But in all humility, I'm going to say this. We're a whole lot farther along than me and you would ever even think about ascribing to. Because you're not trying to strive to enter in at the straight gate. 
You've got questions about everything. And the person that you don't question is yourself. Ask yourself, what does the Father say, or have you created a God in your own mind? Thereby going to repeat the same mistakes of the past. We are getting ready today to celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. We thank y'all because it's the kicking off of the fall feast. We hope we said something that in some way, somehow, brought some education to be able to stimulate thought. I wanted you to hear. I could have actually done the video myself, but what happens whenever, Sister Ashley, whenever only pastor gives his man perspective about everything and the voice of the woman is not included? What, what do people do then? It's called a selfie video, and mm. we are browbeaten. Oh, that's what it is. Brainwash. Brainwash. <laughs> and our opposition in this topic is going to come from the women. Is the honor comes from the men, and they're not going to see that when when they see the video. But you see that? Mm -hmm. So true. Oh, Go ahead, Mother. Also, Pastor, um, as an older woman, I noticed. Speak probably, a little more. As an older woman, I noticed my, when my, me and my twin would be out, mm -hmm. and um, how the men would respect us, open doors, even the a redneck man. Mm -hmm. I was watching him one time, and he saw us coming. And he just had to bow his head mm -hmm. and, and respect, you know, because he saw two women, come, ladies, coming his way. Right. So it, it makes men respect you by being covered. Yeah, it makes them do what they, not, you know, this culture is not familiar to if a man, and it happens right here all the time. It happens so much around here, y'all just used to it. Mm -hmm. That if, if a woman, even a daughter of Zion, mm -hmm. if a man sees her getting ready to go through the door, they automatically go to open up the door for him. It used to be even in this pagan culture and society that if a man would greet a woman, he would tip his hat yes. to the woman. So there was always some form of endearment or respect. But today, it, it's just total mm -hmm. sickness. Mm -hmm. I, I call it a sickness, Caroline. It's nothing but a sickness. <laughs> what do you think, honey? It's sick, isn't it? Absolutely. It's just a sickness. Absolutely. And so the beauty of, of our women is exactly what the book says. Let it not be that outward darn but let it be that hidden man of the heart. Huh? Beauty is vain. That's what it clearly says. But a woman that feared God is greatly to be praised. While our sisters still are beautiful. Still are beautiful. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. While you make yourself vain and you wrestle with this and make yourself fair. Jeremiah said in the fourth chapter, the 30 verse, that you're going to do it in vain. Because all your lovers are going to despise you. I don't care. I don't care, especially when they're doing a deception. Everybody, it's popular day. Everybody wants to be an Israelite. You know it's popular day, right? Everybody wants to be an Israelite now. And you women get deceived. You get deceived out there. Well, we ain't got to go to you. We ain't got to go to no elders. We got to. Don't. Keep on making the same mistakes. Keep on getting humbled. And keep on being ravished. Because that's exactly what's going to happen to you. You're going to keep on being ravished. But the marriages that we put together... It's amazing how peaceful and content and how long they last and how they even at the young age, they're a great example and influence for the ministry all across the world. So in other words, we don't have the same troubles and problems that you people got with all your questions. They that preach it, we just simply live it. We just live it. And I'm watching Sister Angelica over there swing her two children over there uh, on the swings and stuff, and she lives in an environment to where she don't even have to worry about someone trying to come and do her any harm. Mm -hmm. It's not even in her mind mm -hmm. that she even has to even protect herself. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Her children don't have to worry about some pedophile mm -hmm. coming and trying to molest them or take them or steal them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, See, I see these things. It's so beautiful. Looking at Tomoko over there, just hanging her laundry and stuff, and not a care in the world that she's ever going to be harmed in any way, shape, fashion, or form. And then you people wondering if we are cold or not. I think you're the biggest one in the world. I don't want to digress. I'm going to get to preaching. All right? With that said, if there's nothing else, I'm going to bid y'all shalom. That's my mother just came up back there. I'm going to bid y'all shalom. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day.